Hi everybody, Billy again. So we are now getting deeper into chapter four where we do some metabolic flux modeling. Uh, over in this specific lecture, we'll be looking specifically at the catabolism and how to set up the ATP and NADH contributions so that we are able to model the internal rates. And remember, we're doing all of this so that the, in the end, we can have more overall yield coefficients to predict how the reaction will happen and how it will change. So let's get on. I'm going to take an example um, where we start with glucose and uh, our glucose fluxes along the uh, route of glycolysis. But just before we get into glycolysis, which will be happening down here, we take some of the carbon from glucose off. And what we basically do with that is take it through quite a significant amount of steps to make biomass. So we'll be considering biomass production in our flux diagrams as a simple one-step process. So this one-step process, we spoke about it in previous videos, is really uh, quite a lot of reactions, maybe 10 million or so, but we model this as one single reaction. You will see very importantly that a lot of ATP is required to build this biomass and you'll see we get the ATP from the catabolic network. You will also see that um, there is a slight amount of NADH that gets produced when making biomass and we'll balance all of this in the lectures that will follow. But let's get on to the catabolism and uh, where we have the catabolic breakdown. So glucose will go all the way through glycolysis towards pyruvate. And uh, these maps you will typically find on the internet, not on a C-mol basis like we're going to be doing, but on a molecular basis. But let's just draw the map. So from pyruvate, we will go and we will go through the PDH route where we make some CO2. And from here we make acetyl-CoA. And let's say in this example, we make some acetic acid. Okay. But also, let's have a look on the other side, where pyruvate can be carboxylated, so you can actually have an uptake of CO2, and you'll remember this from the TCA cycle in Chapter 2. So here you form azoloacetate, and let's say in this specific example, the azoloacetate will react all the way to formic acid formate, that is within the TCA cycle, and this is the metabolic map that we're going to be considering. So the first thing, when you are... Um, drawing these maps is to know how big the molecules are. So glucose will be a C6. I'm just going to write it next to it. Pyruvate you now, you now know is a C3 molecule. Um, of course CO2 is always a C1. Acetyl-CoA, we only work with the acetyl bit. So this is really a C2 molecule. So is acetic acid. Um, as we go from a C3, taking up a single carbon, we have azoloacetate as a C4 molecule, and it doesn't change because formic acid is also a C4 molecule. This is important because we are going to be considering, when we have a look at these rates coming down, um, the C mole flux. So in a sense, I want you to think of a carbon atom rather not the molecule. So carbon atoms are going down through these network. You can really say they are flowing through the network, the carbon atoms. The carbon atoms are attached. Let's say we have, for example, one and a half hydrogens. That will be the average from the molecule. You remember this from our previous discussion. And uh, um, let's say there is two thirds of a oxygen molecule attached to it. So these carbon atoms with the average attachments, these are really the things that will flux down through the pathway. So I'm just going to get rid of this picture. And now we get back to get back to the flux diagram that we have over here. So what will happen in this flux diagram is that it, at certain steps you will be generating um, ATP. For example, in glycolysis 
we know that we effectively make some ATP um, as we go to pyruvate. Um, because we are now considering the flux of C moles, it's important to get the coefficient, I call it A in the notes, this coefficient um, in front of the ATP. So we know we make two moles of ATP per mole of glucose. So if we only consider the C, the carbon atom flux, we know that for every six atoms fluxing down here, we'll be making two moles of ATP. Remember, ATP can never have a C mole. We only consider that phosphate group, really. So we talk about moles of ATP. So two moles of ATP per six carbon atoms fluxing. So effectively, that will now be a third ATP formed per carbon mole fluxing. You have a similar scenario for NADH, where you make some NADH in glycolysis. It's also two moles of NADH per six hydrocarbons. So it's two divided by six. That's a third NADH that forms. Okay. Um, I'm going to take this picture, make it slightly smaller. Uh, so I'm back. I'm going to take this part, just make it a bit smaller so that we can have a bit more detailed look at some of the steps. Let's have a look at the pyruvate step forming acetyl-CoA. So I'm just going to quickly redraw here. Here we've got pyruvate. We know that there is a CO2 coming off and we have effectively forming the acetyl-CoA which is just a C2 from the acetyl. So we know in this step, first of all, we're going to be numbering. Uh, all our rates because as I said in the previous video all the arrows represent a rate so we might be opting to call this rate let's say it was three this one four this one five okay so important and you'll see it in my notes is some of the notes I'm going to be drawing a blue part around so if I get back to this you'll be seeing that that note that we're discussing here over here and this note over here even this note over here will be colored in blue. What does that mean? Well, that means that these nodes, and this is a specific one that is in blue, are a stoichiometric node. These aren't the same as normal split nodes because split nodes um, will be, for example, here around the pyruvate and also here around the anabolism splitting from the catabolism. These notes, nodes over here are not specified by stoichiometry. So effectively, you don't know which of the carbon atoms are going to go this side and which of the carbon atoms are going to go this side. But for this blue node that we have over here, we know exactly how the split will be. Because pyruvate going to acetyl-CoA and to CO2 is a single chemical reaction. We know that the C3 from pyruvate, one of the carbons goes into CO2 and two of the carbons go into acetyl-CoA. So effectively what we have is that R5, which is the acetyl-CoA rate, and remember that basis for the rate is always C mol X, will effectively be two-thirds of R3. And similar R4 will be a third of R3. Okay, sometimes when we name rates, we, we try and minimize when we've got a simple stoichiometric node like we have over here. We try and not name too many rates, especially if you, if you have these simple relationships. So in that specific case, I will rather opt to say, let's just have one rate name. Let's call this rate, for example, rate three. And on my flux map, and you will see that this effectively makes the um, formulation or the matrix smaller. I will just say if this is R3, this is 3 over 2 R3, and this rate over here will be um, 1 over 2 of R3. <coughs> so you can, of course, you, there's no rules for setting up that matrix. <coughs> Excuse me. You can have as many rates as you like. But let's just talk about the NADH that forms in this specific step where we go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. <coughs> you will know that one mole of NADH is formed, and remember this is a C3, 
one mole of NADH is formed per pyruvate reacting. So we're going to be indicating the NADH. The first question is, should we indicate it on the pyruvate rate above here, or should we maybe indicate it on the acetyl rate over here? The answer is, you can do it in any of the two positions, okay, but you can only do it in one position. So if I opt for, and I'm just going to erase this, if I opt for the above root, okay, so if I opt for this root, um, it's just a so let me just get another color for NADH. So if this is the preferred root over here, I will be making one mole of NADH per mole of C3. So over here, I'm effectively forming a third of NADH. Okay. Of course, if I add my NADH on this specific flux or street, uh, rate over here, I cannot add it over here. You cannot add it twice. But if I did not add it over here, so uh, if I did not do this one, sorry, I've got an issue with my razor here, and I've opted to put the NADH in here, you will see that you're effectively forming a mole of H per two carbons, because over here, we'll only have two carbons fluxing to acetyl, o, uh, acetyl CoA. So you have one mole of NADH per C2 fluxing, and because one of the C's has been lost in the CO2 excretion, so basically what we will have now is a half of mole of NADH that gets produced um, if you indicate the flux over here. Okay, um, that's about it. Just to quickly rephrase, please note that we think of C moles that are fluxing all through the pathway. We distinguish between split points where we can't really um, know exactly how it's going to split but we know that at these little pink nodes the flux model will determine how the carbon moles that are fluxing splits so very important to count your molecule sizes so that when you um, calculate the ATP or the NADH contributions you express them as the, the correct ratio. Also, where you do your placement of your NADH or ATP sections, just be careful that you have the corresponding coefficient for the corresponding placement. Okay, that's it for now.